Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Honorable Ministers of Government, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Professor Nigel Harris, Campus Principal, Professor Archer MacDonald, other distinguished members of the government and the university executives, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and by no means least, students of the University of the West Indies, welcome. It gives us particular pleasure to be able to host this event and to host the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, because this university has been at the forefront of the debate within the development context about development policy for 40 years. And it really is entirely appropriate that an institution that is critical to the development process and the head of that institution come here and participate in that debate. So we are very pleased, thrilled to, to welcome the, the MD of the fund here today. We are at the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies, but this is much like a visit to the entire University of the West Indies. We have a live audience at the Cave Hill campus in Barbados and the St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago. And they're going to be sending us questions as well. So it is going to be a most interesting afternoon. We're also being live streamed throughout the world. So we do hope to make the, the time worth your while. We're going to start off proceedings by inviting the Vice Chancellor to officially welcome Madame Lagarde to the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. Madame Christine Lagarde, Minister Peter Phillips, uh, author, a principal of the Mona campus, uh, Professor Archibald MacDonald, other distinguished guests. I wish to start by extending a warm welcome to you, Madame Lagarde, to the Regional University of the West Indies. We are a university that extends across a million square miles of sea with sites as far away as Bermuda in the north, to Belize in the west, to Trinidad and Tobago in the south, and Barbados in the east. The, the immense importance of your visit to Jamaica is probably best evidenced by your capturing the headlines and editorials of both national newspapers in Jamaica. It is a reflection of how the IMF presence is seen in a country dealing with unprecedented economic challenges, challenges that are not only local, but reflect a global economic and geopoli geopolitical uncertainty of a magnitude not seen in nearly a century. Your lecture is an important moment of opportunity for our regional university to demonstrate how institutions like ours can establish a space, a neutral space, where ideas and formulations about major issues being tackled by national, regional, and global communities can be debated and discussed. One of today's newspapers noted that you were ranked number five on the Forbes magazine's world's most powerful women's list. In truth, whatever the list, your intellectual prowess and personal achievements are an astounding example of what is possible for young women and indeed young men in our university, Jamaica, and our region. And for this reason too, your presence is important. As we anticipate your discussion today, 
I recall having the opportunity to watch your superb BBC Dimbleby lecture in February this year. Your grasp and articulation of the profound changes that have transformed our world in the last century was as instructive as it was impressive. You spoke of the geopolitical and economic uncertainties of 1914, not unlike those facing us in 2014. The impact of the 1944 Bretton Woods Agreement in creating and forging a new world order of cooperation and you're identifying some of the major challenges facing us today, demographic shifts, environmental degradation, and income inequality, were important and of particular relevance uh, to our university. Of emphasis in your talk was the vital importance of investment in education in tackling the challenges we face. Education not only for young people, but for the entire population. Even as Jamaica and other countries work with the IMF to reposition themselves on a growth path, we hope that a commitment to education is not forgotten by our governments and organizations like the IMF. Today's newspapers also carried news of the UB Mona campus being forced to seek an overdraft facility for the first time in many, many years. And it reminds us <coughs> that in order for our university to contribute to the intellectual ferment, as well as the social and economic growth of our countries in which we live, we must be properly resourced. Let me close, Madame Lagarde, by thanking you again for agreeing to have this visit with us. And I express the hope that your visit to Jamaica can provide greater understanding by the IMF and like bodies of the social and economic challenges we face. And your organization can help provide the insight and assistance in charting a route to future prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. The history of the fund in Jamaica goes back almost 40 years. I think it's a fair comment to say that it has been a tortured history, although the torturing seems to have been done equally on both sides. So it is entirely appropriate that Madame Lagarde's address to us is on the topic of the Caribbean and the IMF, and it looks forward to a partnership, hopefully in the future, that will be for at least another 40 years. Madame Lagarde. Thank you so much. Shall I do that? Yes, it's going to be brought to you. Ah, oh, that's better. <laughs> I'm pleased that this thing was lifted and that this thing will remain uh, gentle and quiet other than to carry uh, my voice and my words. Uh, Professor Archibald MacDonald, principal of the Mona Campus, Dr. Damian King, wherever you've gone. Um, indeed, Mr. Finance Minister, here Peter Phillips, um, and all of you attending this, uh, this session at uh, university, members of uh, the government, representatives of authorities, members of the public sector, and most importantly, the students uh, who, interestingly, are all seated at the back. You know, it, remi it reminds me of my days when, of course, we did sit in the back of the room and there were a few seats left vacant at the front. But those of you who are standing, feel free and comfortable to move towards the front. It will be fine. Now, I would like to point out that our moderator, uh, Dr. Damian King, uh, is no stranger to me, no stranger to the fund. He was one of the academic fellows invited to our annual meetings, and it is with great pleasure that I uh, see him again on the occasion of this, uh, this presentation. 
I know that the University of West Indies is a true haven of higher learning. And I'm very grateful, Mr. Vice Chancellor, that you took the trouble to listen to the Dimbleby lecture. It's actually one that I worked really hard on and meant to actually convey some of the messages that I strongly believe in, which are not necessarily core business for the IMF, although they are very, very solidly related, whether we're talking about the virtue of education, whether we're talking about the environment and the respect that we should have for the environment, or whether we're talking about inequality, all of those are of macro uh, critical dimension, which is why I think that we should be mindful of them. Now, the excellence of your university is unparalleled. And I have to tell you that I have attended and participated in many lectures around the world, but I have never given a lecture in front of an audience belonging to a regional university. I've spoken at local universities, state university, national universities, but never a regional universities. And I would like to salute on this occasion, not only the students who are here in the room, but also the students who are linked up to us. And I think you said that they were from Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago. And 16 other countries, goodness me. Right, well, I, I very respectfully uh, salute all of you. Now, the quality of a university is often um, tested by the prominence of its alumni. And obviously, we looked at your alumni list, and it's quite impressive. Uh, they pepper across the top echelons of their fields, whether they are CEOs, whether they are scientists, whether they are artists, whether they are entrepreneurs, whether they're professors, whether they are public servants. These alumni actually include 18 current or former heads of state or prime ministers. And it can claim a Nobel Prize winner in literature, Derek Walcott, whom I will quote later on, as well as a Nobel Prize winner in economics, the remarkable Arthur Lewis, who was also, as I remember, vice chancellor uh, in, in your stead a while back. So you have a great legacy, and all of you students of these universities should be encouraged, not necessarily humbled, but should be encouraged to belong to this uh, track of talent. Second thing I would like to say by way of introduction is how delighted I am to come to Jamaica. This is my first visit to your beautiful country, and it is certainly not the last. I made a commitment to Honorable Peter Phillips that I will come back as a private citizen in order to check our new tourist industry. <laughs> I think all I can really, how many of you have read by Alexandre Dumas, The Four Musketeers? Some of you have. Well, thank you. So it's quite a good book, actually. But you know, when I think of, of your country and your people, I think of panache. You know, D'Artagnan had panache. But you have poetic panache. You can laugh. You can create. You can innovate. And that is quite extraordinary. I will speak to that in a moment. It is also quite rare to find so much talent in what is, after all, a rather small territory. Jamaica is home to the world's best sports people. Not my sport, I'm not a sprinter. But my goodness, Usain Bolt and Shelly Ann Fraser Price are really uh, top individuals. It is home to some of the world's most soulful mu musicians, the birthplace of reggae and Bob Marley, of course, as well as, most lately, Tessan. Do you pronounce it Tessan? Yeah. Well, she's the new singing sensation, I can tell you. And I can tell you that because I had no idea about her. So I had to call my sons. And they said, what? You don't know her? <laughs> oh, these old people <laughs> teaches you humility. It is also home to some of the world's most gifted writers. Think of the lyricism of Claude McKay and Louise Bennett. And this is not just about Jamaica, although Jamaica has a lot to claim. 
we can see the same level of talent all across the region. Derek Walcott hails from St. Lucia, and another Nobel Prize winner in literature, uh, B.S. Napal, comes from Tin Trinidad and Tobago. Grenada can boast Kirani James, the reigning Olympic 400 meter champion. Rihanna, the chart topping songstress, comes from Barbados. And of course, Sidney Poitier, the legendary actor, comes from Bar the Bahamas. So it is abundantly clear that Jamaica and the entire Caribbean region simply exude capacity, capability, creation, and innovation. I know, though, that despite these talents, the Caribbeans have gone through a tough time over the past few years. You know this here in Jamaica. You have lived it. You're still living it. But you generation, this generation, holds the key to the future. When your immense talents are put to the service of your countries, success has to happen. Now, indeed, I can feel a powerful wave of change. And I believe that the region has set sail on a voyage towards greater prosperity. And Jamaica is raising its sails with confidence. What I would like to do on the occasion of this lecture is talk about two things in particular. One is talk about the change that has come to the Caribbean and to Jamaica in particular. And second, how the Caribbean can keep changing to ensure a successful journey. And then I will say a few things about how the IMF has had to change as well and to adapt. And that will be my conclusion. Let me start with how the region is changing. Trading lethargy for liftoff. And I'm not being dismissive about it. We're just looking at numbers. The need for change is clear. The Caribbean has had a tendency to get stuck in the doldrums of stagnation. Low growth, high debt, low competitiveness, high unemployment, particularly for the young people. This has been especially true for countries depending largely on tourism, like Jamaica. And in these countries, growth has averaged less than 2% a year since the mid-90s. I know there have been a couple of years where growth was a lot higher, but that was really very incidental. That was Jamaica which is not at an average of 2%. It's an average of 1%. So for the Caribbean as a region, we're talking about an average of less than 2%. For Jamaica, it's 1%. Now, I recognize that this picture does not apply to all countries in the region. Natural resources-based countries like Trinidad and Tobago, Suriname and Guyana have been able to achieve higher growth thanks to stronger commodity market. But in other countries, stagnation can be traced to a number of factors. Productivity and competitiveness have suffered from overvalued exchange rate. I would call them wrongly valued exchange rate. And I'll explain to that, I'll explain that later on. And high energy costs. Confidence has been hurt by the high debt and macroeconomic volatility. Everyone has had to cope with the high frequency of natural disasters. Now, given this legacy shared by the Caribbean islands, the Caribbean was particularly vulnerable going into the global financial crisis and was hit with it with full force. Six years on, growth has still not returned to pre-crisis levels, and public debt is still at record highs almost 100% of GDP in tourism-dependent countries, and 140% of GDP in Jamaica. And as always, the poor and vulnerable were hit hardest by the crisis. Across the region, about a third of young people were out of work. In Jamaica, the poverty rate doubled to 7.5%, after having declined significantly prior. To that. And with the doors of opportunity barred for so many, the result is disengagement, disenchantment, and exclusion, as we all know, can create inflam inflammatory situation that often result in increased 
insecurity and a steady deterioration in the quality of life. So clearly then, the crisis was a major wake-up call. Caribbean leaders understand the need for change, not just to free themselves from the grip of crisis, but to adapt to the challenges of the global new norm. What am I talking about, the global new norm? Well, look at the interconnectedness between countries, between people, between companies, between banks. It has never been as connected as it is. The engines of growth are still solid in the United States and in Europe, but they're gradually shifting away east. The cozy comfort of trade preferences is long gone. And I know that for a fact I've been negotiating WTO, or trying to negotiate WTO arrangement for a couple of years when I was trade minister for my country. The specter of climate change hovers over the small island states. As Derek Walcott put it, the future happens no matter how much we scream. So change begins with restoring economic stability. This establishes a platform for rising and shared prosperity and also for dignity. Leaders have begun to deliver on that front, in a few cases with bold and far-reaching reforms. This includes Jamaica, which has made some hard choices to get growth higher and debt lower. Those are the objectives. Get growth higher, debt lower, restore confidence, make sure that public finances are sustainable, that there can be investment, that there can be job creations. And obviously, multiple tools have to be used to reach that end. We know that hard choices are made easier when implemented in a spirit of solidarity and shared sacrifice. This is clearly confirmed by Jamaica's experience. We're not shying away from how difficult it has been for the people of Jamaica and how much pain and sacrifices there has been. But the measures decided by the Jamaican authorities, which we have endorsed and which we are supporting, try to spread the burden across society. Wage freeze on civil servants, debt exchange for financial investors, increases in taxes and tariffs for water and transportation, and higher import prices as the exchange rate was allowed to adjust to the right valuation where it should have been, as opposed to the clear overvaluation that it was at. And while the government was cutting spending, it was doing its best to protect the most vulner vulnerable, raising cash transfers for poor households by 67% for the elderly and 15% across the board for all the others, with another 15% increase which is planned for October. And that is intended to take into account inflation, but also additional cash transfers for those poor and vulnerable households. Jamaica has also come up with a great innovation in ownership because when those reforms are conducted, you don't want to leave a minister, be him the finance minister, Honorable Peter Phillips. You want complete ownership and support to be given. And the government's reform program is being monitored by an outside group. I don't know if you've heard about that. The Economic Program Oversight Committee. This is something that I had never heard of that none of my staff at the IMF had heard of, and which is a real novation on the part of Jamaica. And it's one that will, from my point of view, be coined, duplicated, and encouraged in many other programs going forward. Because these people, yeah. They're drawn from all stands of society public sector, private sector, civil society, trade unions, you just name it. I met with them earlier today, we had lunch together, and I came away extremely impressed with their commitment and dedication 
to improve the situation of the Jamaican economy. This is clearly a role model going forward. So where do we stand? Jamaica is not out of the wood just yet, but we can already see signs of calm seas ahead. The public purse looks much healthier. Growth is back. Not talking about the hardly 1%. We are north of 1% and going up next year. As I said, the economy is growing at a rate of 1.6% year over year in the first quarter of 2014. If you look at other countries in the vicinity or a bit north, it's certainly not as good as that number that you've uh, turned up. And both inflation and external current account deficit have come down. We can see similar signs in some other countries that are navigating their way through difficult reforms. For example, public debt has fallen down by 15% of GDP in Antigua and by one third in St. Kitts and Nevis. In some countries, growth is on the rebound. St. Kitts and Nevis, for, for instance, grew by almost 4% last year after years of decline. And yet, we are really only at the beginning of a journey. By the way, Jamaica has also reduced its public debt by seven uh, points. Achieving lasting success will take time for Jamaica and for the Caribbean as a whole. Which takes me to my second point, continuing with change to complete the journey. And by this uh, I mean building on stability to lay the structural foundations of sustained and inclusive growth. And I'm confident that this can be done. You have it within your power to do it, to bring to life the beautiful vision of Claude McKay who wrote with such pregnancy about Jamaica, I shall return again, I shall return, to laugh and love and watch with wonder eyes. The region certainly has a proven ability to adapt and change. Remember, the Caribbean shifted from predominantly agricultural economy to a service economy with a high activity in the field of tourism and anything that is indirectly connected to tourism. It's a leap that has eluded many. The Caribbean is also home, thanks to University of West Indies and a few others, home to highly educated, highly driven people. I can see it here today. The region welcomes the contribution and leadership of women. I've checked my numbers on women, by the way. Jamaica is doing quite well. Can always do better. Clear evidence of that, by the way, is your prime minister. I had the honor of meeting with her this morning. And I have to tell you that for me, in addition to having had a thorough discussion about what additional structural reforms need to be implemented, to be greeted by a woman of that caliber is a rare privilege. Yeah. Now, I would be remiss not to mention uh, Kamla Persad Bissessar from Trinidad and Tobago as well. Added to that, the Caribbean has a legacy of good institutions with a thriving tradition of democracy and political accountability. This all bodes well for the future especially if the region can get to grips with the twin challenges of competitiveness and climate change. And that's what I would like to talk about now. Competitiveness is vital in a region of small, open economies that rely on tourism. Competing in world markets means keeping a lead on production cost. In Jamaica, letting the exchange rate right value by way of depreciation for the moment, but there might be a time when it's not depreciation anymore for the right value to be arrived at. It may very well be evaluation, revaluation, not devaluation. I want to be around when that happens. I'll come. We know it is painful. 
but it has helped restore a good deal of lost competitiveness and it will support investment and job creations. When investors look at a place to invest, they compare competitiveness, they compare tax costs, they compare energy costs, and I'll come to that. But because it's a big issue. High energy cost can actually be a drag on foreign direct investment. Electricity costs three times as much in Jamaica as in the United States. It costs even more in Barbados. So conserving and renewing energy alongside efforts to bring more competition and dynamism to the energy sector will be important. I know that the government is committed and that they're going to proceed and have the project under review at the moment. The region also needs to invest more smartly in education and training to link the skills that are needed by the economy to the skills that can be deployed by the students. Third area where change needs to happen. Critical to improve the business climate, which is less hospitable in the Caribbean than in other dynamic small economies. And this, inclu this includes eliminating as much of the red tape as there is and making labor markets more effective in creating jobs. I'll give you one example which is being addressed by the government and that's in the area of lending permit and development of real estate project. There was too much backlog. This is being addressed. The time to instruct those files was too long. This is being addressed. In tandem, the public sector must play an enabling role through greater predictability, greater transparency, and impartiality. For instance, fiscal incentives could be made simpler and less murky. I've been a finance minister. Murky deals are never promoted by finance ministers. But finance ministers must have the authority to say, no, we don't do that incentive regime. And I know that Honorable Peter Phillips is of that caliber. Again, Jamaica is making huge progress in that area. In all of this, the Caribbean would also gain from greater cooperation. A difficult task is always made easier when more people lend a hand, and a lot easier when they work together. For example, a regional approach to transportation infrastructure and the marketing of tourism might work better than each country pressing for its own advantage. Each country offering a little tax holiday here, a little special subsidy there. This is not helpful. Countries have to be together and they have to actually unite in the face of those foreign direct investment project. Because otherwise, let's make no mistake, those foreign investors will arbitrage. They will play one against the other. So cooperation is better. As Mandela said, one finger doesn't matter. The whole hand helps. And we say, by definition, a race to the bottom leaves everybody at the bottom. Not in the short run, but in the medium run. So that's on competitiveness. As I said, critical factors skill set of the people who have to adapt to the skill set expected of them by the economy, predictability, transparency of the business climate, special focus on energy in order to reduce the cost of energy, cooperation amongst the Caribbeans. Now, competitiveness that would ignore climate change is hollow competitiveness. As climate change continues its relentless march, the Caribbean is on the front line. A region of low-lying islands surrounded by increasingly angry seas, as but one stark example, Georgetown, Guyana's capital, lies entirely below sea level as it is today. For the Caribbean, climate change creates a climate of fear. And yes, you have the Blue Mountain there. but the sea level is likely to go up. People know that their land, their lovely livelihood, 
and even their lives are at stake. This is a first order global priority for all of us. The global community must come together to save our planet before it is too late. Yet, even though climate change requires a global solution, and there is a debate currently going on at the UNCCC, which will take its course, and I know that Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is strongly pushing for that to make progress, and we at the IMF are trying to lend a hand to him in order to make sure that there is progress. But we also believe at the IMF that each and every country can do its share of the work and can actually achieve some results at its own level. So we don't have to wait for the UNCCC to come up with final commitments, final decrease in the uh, emissions, final across the board agreed carbon tax or cap and trade systems. For a start, there are measures that can be taken, including in the Caribbean, to protect the people and make its economy more resilient to the forces of nature. It can invest in the infrastructure needed to better withstand natural disasters. It can improve water management to stop salted water from infiltrating valuable freshwater sources. It can protect people through better land planning. It can improve the institutional setup of disaster management. It can strengthen catastrophic risk insurance framework. Ultimately, if the region can get to grips with these challenges, I believe that its voyage will be successful, especially if it takes place on board three ships. What do I mean by that? Three ships. They're not cruise liners, no. They're not pirate ships, or the three ships of Christopher Columbus. Rather, the ships I have in mind are ownership, stewardship, and partnership. Ownership of the reform program, so that all citizens take a stake in success. Stewardship of the economy, nurturing its resources and investing in its people. Partnership with each other public sector, private sector. I have to say, by the way, that it is quite rare to see that a government in place has a degree of support from the opposition. In my country, it wouldn't happen that way. So I think it is to be recognized and celebrated to the extent that there is collective ownership. Now, I've talked about ownership, I've talked about stewardship, I've talked about partnership my three ships. The IMF is a partner, and the IMF wants to be a partner. In my Dimbleby lecture, I referred back to the days when the IMF was set up in 1944 uh, on, the, uh, on the remains of this terrible World War II, which had destroyed so many lives and so many assets across Europe the United States, Australia, the UK, Canada, and all those, New Zealand, who had participated in the rescue. At the time the IMF was funded, it was intended to be a club, a club of the countries that would help each other. So when you have a program with the IMF, you don't have a program with me. You don't have a program with Jan Kies, who is quite famous, as I'm told, in Jamaica. You have a program and you have a deal with the international community, with all members of the IMF. It's 188 countries that actually pool some of their resources and make sure that it is there available to give support to members that are going through tough times in terms of balance of payment, essentially. This is what it was intended for 70 years ago. Now, we have evolved over time. And from doing very traditional, it's mostly fiscal, which stood for IMF. We have evolved in many ways over the last 70 years. And we are now clearly established in three lines of businesses. One is policy advice, relying on surveillance that is consented by all members as a reciprocated gesture to each other 
and who see some value in the policy advice that is given, that policy advice is actually enriched now by multilateral surveillance, more focus on uh, what happens on a cluster basis, and I would suggest that the Caribbean is clearly one where that cluster approach is effective. We provide lending, that's you know, what I mentioned, and we have done a lot of that during the financial crisis. We have uh, disbursed uh, over $200 billion in order to support countries during the crisis, from sub-Saharan Africa to the heart of Europe, to the Caribbean, to some Latin American countries, using, interestingly, some new instrument, not necessarily the traditional EFF or the traditional SBA, but sometimes going into FCL. OK. What do you think of that? EFF, SBA, FCL. You know, when I joined the IMF as managing directors, that's how they talked to me. <laughs> and I said, I don't get it. You have to explain to me what you're talking about. The flexible credit line is, in my view, a very good example of how we can improve the services that we provide to our members. And it's an instrument that operates as almost a seal of approval. It's a credit line that is available, that is either drawn on or not by the country, but that is renewed until such time when the country is out of potential trouble for as long as the country delivers on its commitment and applies a good set of policies. That's one example of how we have evolved. The third line of business we're in, and that's where I'd like to spend just a little bit of time, is the technical assistance. This is the line of business that is growing by far the most. What do we provide? Capacity building, technical assistance, and training. We did it by partnering with countries and supporting their efforts to get out of the crisis. These country, countries in the Caribbean include Antigua and Barbuda, San Kitts and Nevis, Jamaica, and now Grenada. We've also helped countries get back on their feet after the devastation of natural disasters, including in Haiti, Dominica, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent, and the Grenadines. This exercise of lending, supporting financially, is completed by the capacity building that we offer. Now, one would normally think that capacity building is there for uh, the needy countries. And you would typically think of, say, sub-Saharan Africa countries, or some of the small countries and vulnerable countries. Not at all. We have provided technical assistance and training to about 90% of the membership during the time of the crisis. So from Libya to Greece, to Myanmar, to Jamaica, we have extended technical assistance and capacity building. Again, we are heavily involved in helping the Caribbean countries build capacity, including through CARTAC, our technical assistance center in Barbados. In this region, we have paid special attention to strengthening public financial management system. And for those of you who are interested in e-learning, we are also moving to a university-sponsored platform on which we make available courses of general interest for civil servants, but generally open to all, and concerning public finance management, concerning debt sustainability analysis, and we are planning on increasing uh, the uh, courses that will be available in that way. Now, what I would like to conclude with is that the IMF has changed. There are many countries around the world where the IMF does not enjoy a stellar reputation. That's an understatement. Yes, I know. And we, we are viewed in harsh terms in some places. I think much of this criticism is now unfair. Because, you know, after all, many of the countries that come to us, not for the capacity building, not for the training, not for the policy advice, but for the lending, they do that because they have no options and they have not taken the measures, they have not been fiscally responsible enough to actually 
keep their public finance in order, to actually keep their debt at a sustainable level. And it's when, it's when markets actually close up on them that they turn to the fund and say, what shall we do? And I think that's you know, essentially one of the reasons why we are a bit of a scapegoat, frankly. But the truth of the matter is that the countries that come to us are in dear economic straits. But some of the harsh criticism is valid. We may not always have gotten it right in the past, but we are committed to listen and to learn, to adapt and to change, to be humble and open-minded. And that's what we have been doing. As some have said, this is no longer the IMF of, of grandpapa. Maybe it's because I'm a mother. <laughs> now today we're putting the highest priority not on fiscal, although it's a clear, critical component, but we're putting the focus on growth and jobs. We're getting more involved in less traditional areas that matter for growth and stability, such as taming excessive and rising inequality, grappling with climate change, enticing more women into the labor force, and facilitating financial inclusions. We're putting more emphasis on protecting social safety nets and sharing the burden of adjustment fairly. And we fully support what Jamaica and others have done in that respect. As Prime Minister Mitchell from Granada put it recently, I always knew that the IMF had a head. Now it appears it also has a heart. Now my view is that they complement each other. You need the head, you need the heart. You need the heart, you need the head. So let me conclude on that note. I believe that the old paradigms are dead. Both the Caribbean and the IMF are very different today from what they were 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. You have changed, we have changed. We might have started far apart, and our track record is not great, as you rightly said. But it's clearly improving, and we want to listen and learn, be available as your partner. On that note, I think it is fitting to invoke Derek Walcott once again, who talked longingly about the days when every street corner rounds itself into a sunlit surprise. May those days come and never depart. And may this beautiful country and this remarkable region be blessed. Thank you very much. Everyone who pays attention will realize it's a, it's a busy, chaotic world with Greece imploding and the Ukraine exploding and Sub-Saharan Africa trying very hard to grow, doing so rather successfully. China having done so at a great breakneck pace, slowing down somewhat. And these are all interests of, of the International Monetary Fund and the Managing Director. And so we are pleased and surprised that you're here <laughs> in the midst of all of the demands upon your time. And I'd just, the first question I'd like to ask you is, you know, what is the significance of your visit to the Caribbean at this time? Why, why, why here and why now? Well, first of all, because I was invited. <laughs> Second, because I wanted to pay tribute to Minister Phillips, to his colleagues, under the leadership of uh, you, most honorable Prime Minister, for what has been, as I've mentioned to her this morning, uh, a clear change of course, not only in the relationship between Jamaica and the IMF, but the change of course in deciding to tackle the issues head on, and to make the hard choices, and to successfully complete full review of the first year of the program. You know, the, the story of Jamaica with the IMF has been bumpy, to say the least. Programs started, programs suspended, programs renewed, programs resuspended. And what I'm 
saying here to the authorities, to the private sector, um, to civil society representatives is it's important that you stay the course. And it's important that you don't waste uh, the outstanding results that you've already uh, put under your belt in the last 15 months. And we're here to help you. Um, that's, but as I said, I will come back to Jamaica as a private citizen. It has, it has been a demanding program. And it started with, with relatively low expectations because of this long history of failed attempts by Jamaica to be faithful to these programs. So it's fair to say that some of us are quite surprised that the program has come this far. But it is also true that it has taken a tremendous effort on the part of the government to be able to implement a very demanding program. And from what we can see, it has stretched their capacity very much to the limit. The reason why this is important, Madame Lagarde, is that this actually is the problem. A lot of these countries end up with fiscal problems and difficulties in managing the, the demands made upon the governments mm -hmm. by impatient electorates because they have weak governance capacity. Now, this is especially true in small states. And so, once we identify that that is the problem, I'm wondering if, if that really is one of the reasons why, why developing countries and small states in particular have had a problem adhering to, to, to fund programs and whether this, this weak capacity issue is something that you know, needs to be taken account more. Mm. I just want to know what you thought of that. Yeah, I think you have a point because um, conducting all these reforms uh, under pressure under the pressure of a degree of fiscal consolidation, a degree of right valuation for the currency, um, a strong monetary policy, all of that is actually drawing on the resources of the teams. And by the same token, they still have to present their draft bills to Parliament. They still have to uh, do the uh, necessary work of uh, casualing um, members of Parliament, making sure that they're on the on the same page, um, all the day-to-day -day work that governments have to do. So that's also the reason why we are trying to provide technical assistance in the fields where we have the expertise. So whether it's the Fiscal Affairs Department or whether it would be the uh, MCM Department, if that was needed, uh, we would be happy and we will be happy to provide uh, technical assistance. But other international institutions have to do the same thing. The World Bank, the International, the Inter-American Development Bank also have to provide the level of support and the level of technical assistance that is required. They have expertise in fields where we don't. Uh, you know, when you talk about uh, energy policy, when you talk about um, financial inclusions, uh, those are areas where the bank has more expertise than we do. When you talk about structural reforms, we have limited expertise. In fiscal, we do, but not in all, all fields. It's actually quite interesting to hear you talk about the, the different pillars of activity in, at the fund, because there was a time 20 years ago when the view of the role of the IMF was that they gave us lots of money, and in exchange for the money, we had to suffer through conditionalities. And the conditionalities was the medicine you took in order to you know, or, or, or the price you paid in order to just get the money. Mm. It is seem now more, much more like the opposite. Because certainly in the context of the size of Jamaica's fiscal problems and Jamaica's debt, it really is a small amount of money. But the benefit actually is that we get the institutional support, yeah. the policy framework, you know, and, and the guidance which, which you know, tries to meet this problem of, of weak institutional capacity. So going forward, it certainly makes sense that this is a big activity of the fund. The question I want to ask you is, what are the challenges of trying to push that agenda, which really is the important part of the, the agenda? That's going to, you know, that is the teaching the, 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 the poor person to fish rather than giving them fish. What, is the, what are the challenges of pushing that part of the agenda 
while obviously being respectful to government's way of doing things and with frankly reluctant governments around the world who have other agendas, many of them political and, and electoral? Well, I would say uh, two things. One is timing is critical uh, because more often than not, the reforms have to be conducted um, rapidly because people want to see the results. People want to understand what changes are taking place. And when you're trying to improve the competitiveness, when you're trying to improve the business friendly environment, when you're trying to improve transparency, when you're trying to collect more tax uh, from those that you know, have their interesting uh, tax optimization schemes, when you're trying to close those loopholes and implement it, time is of the essence. You can't just drag the process on. You have to show your resilience and determination in doing so. So that's one. This, and I'm not talking here about Jamaica. I'm talking in general. And there are major programs that we have recently concluded with countries where it's a big issue. I'd say that the second uh, impediment and the second major contributor is talent. And it's not that often that you find the technical experts who have the political skins and uh, vocabulary and behavioral approach in order to deliver on those, on those reforms. You know, the, the fiscal component, uh, reducing spendings or prioritizing spendings and reducing your deficit, uh, collecting on taxes, in a way, I'm not saying that it's easy, it's very hard. But it's not probably as difficult as it is to improve the business environment. Where do you start? What is going to make the investors tick and choose Jamaica or Barbados or Granada over another island without it being a race to the bottom, as I said? So I would say timing and talent are the two uh, critical component, components. I indicated, of course, that uh, the Caribbean and Jamaica in particular has had a 40-year history with the fund. I think and it joined in 1963. Right, but yeah. as, uh, our first lending agreement was 1977. So that's the history I'm referring to. So it's understandable that, you know, we have some questions. Yeah. Uh, we have persons with microphones going around. See, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please raise your hand and indicate to one of those persons. In the meantime, you, you, you talk in your presentation about, about the way that the fund has changed. Now, it wasn't it wasn't even 20 years ago that the annual meetings took place in a context where members of civil society who had different views would be behind barricades outside of the, the block where the fund and the bank are, you know, shouting their objections while the meetings took place within. Now, I know for sure that has changed because not only are those views that used to protest outside the barricades now brought inside the meetings yeah. and listened to you pay for it. You pay for these persons to fly from all over the world. Yep. They come inside the meetings. They meet with you. I was in one of those meetings. Yep. How, what have you learned? You and the, the hierarchy of the fund, what have you learned from, from, from engaging with civil society in this way over the last 20 years? Two things. One is, by virtue of the process, the process itself, it shows that the IMF cares that we're not just looking at numbers, that we also know that behind the numbers there are people. And around the people there are non-governmental organizations, civil society, social media, that are trying to harness support and canvas views. So the, 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 the mere fact that we reach out, I sit down with them, the communication department spends at least two days with them, hosting them, and, and hearing comments, views, objections that they have, I think that in and of itself is extremely beneficiary. I think the second um, value of it is that it has made us change. I think it has made us change in the way we look at um, the labor market, in the way we look at social safety nets, in the way we pay more attention to things like climate change in the way we are particularly mindful of the integration of women in the economy and what measures need to be taken. So in each and every categories represented by those 
uh, social medias, um, civil society representatives, and non-governmental organizations. We learn and we change. Yeah, I, I, I must confess that, that I was really quite taken aback by that. And the amount of times that I heard about country-specific conditions and inclusiveness, yeah. pretty much in every context, made me wonder, and let me give you a heads up that this is going to be a case of damned if you do and damned if you don't, that if there is not a danger of losing focus on some of the things that do in fact cut across all countries, you yeah. cannot run repeated fiscal deficits when you are a highly indebted country and expect any kind of you know, economic growth. You know? so, sure. so is there a danger in all of this that you, you, know, you lose focus on the things that do cut across all countries and that are, that are really unchangeable? From Jamaica's point of view, I can tell you that you know, running unchecked fiscal balances don't work. We've tried that. It doesn't work. Hmm. So you know, is the fund going to be able to sort of maintain that balance? You know, one of the beauties of the fund, when it was set up 70 years ago, is that the founders thought about those issues. And when they drafted the articles of the IMF, they clearly had in mind what was going to be the main purpose of the fund. So they defined the mandate very carefully. It's about financial stability, but it also includes growth. And it's made country-specific by virtue of the Article 4, which is the way we do surveillance on a bilateral basis and provide policy advice. So I think that premonition has served us well. Because while we continue to focus, and we'll have to continue to focus on delivering on our mandate, we also have to be mindful of the changing world around us. And while keeping the focus on fiscal sanity, reducing debt for those countries that have unsustainably high debt will remain key to our programs, will remain key uh, in our assessment. Because you simply cannot borrow your consumption out of excessive indebtedness. That's, that just doesn't work. But by the same token, we also need to look at what is a break on growth. Why, for instance, uh, the Japanese labor market is not integrating Japanese women who are much better educated, who will be a response to the lack of growth in Japan. By the same token, again, and it's being fiscally responsible, we need to look at how countries can gradually do away with energy subsidies because it's a double winner. You remove the energy subsidies in a smart, transitional way, maintaining cash transfers to those who are most in need of those uh, cash transfers. But you remove the subsidies for those that no, don't need the subsidies. And by doing that, you bring more revenue into your fiscal position because you don't spend that you know, in some countries, it's something in the range of 7% of GDP that is being spent on energy subsidies. So I know it looks a bit funny that the IMF is looking at energy subsidies. It's a bit funny that the fund is looking at women, work, and growth. It's a bit funny that we are looking at the spillovers of corporate tax around the world. But it's directly related to our mandate. And I think we will continue to do that without losing the focus of what I said earlier. Good. I'm going to ask that in asking your questions, a lot of people here have questions, so I'm going to make two requests of you. One is that to respect everybody else who has a question, that you only ask one question at a time. If you have a second question, then you wait until the microphone comes back to you again. And secondly, that you do in fact have a question and not use the opportunity to make a long speech. Please identify yourself by name before you begin. Yeah. Who has the first question? Garnet Ropo. The question I have is whether or not the IMF has in fact changed. Thank you for the charm and courtesy in the 
delivery of the speech, really very interesting. But isn't the valuation the strategy that has always been used, and isn't that a way of victimizing the victim with the outcome that the, com the country is almost a stamping ground for these suitcase investors, like they had in the Asian Tigers, and that in the end, what we end up with is a country of migrant workers who can really um, be exploited by the metropolis. Is there an outcome different from that that you envisage by this devaluation, or as you call it, right valuation strategy? And are you a student or are you a journalist? <laughs> I'm sorry I missed that. Are you a student? No, I'm not a student. You're a journalist. Well, I have many things, but I'm not a student. I know. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not going to pass a judgment on how the Asian tigers or other economies around the world are uh, choosing their economic line and aligning it with their democratic principles. This is, this is not what the IMF is about. I can do that as a private citizen myself, but it's not the role of the IMF. As I said, the founders, whether it was Lord Maynard Keynes or Mr. White and their colleagues, created the IMF with a view to maintaining financial stability. And we believe at the IMF that financial stability is actually the platform from which you can develop value, contribute to the economy. Now, you may have noted recently that we published quite extensively some papers about excessive inequality. And we, we were not the last one at the party. Other people have published, but we have published as well. So we are not oblivious to economic trends that have a macroeconomic impact. And we believe that rising inequality, for instance, is not compatible with sustainable growth. Equally, we have also concluded, based on empirical work, that redistributive policy do not necessarily equal lower growth, which was the conventional wisdom. So, you know, in our own way, within the parameters of our mandate, we also explore some of the ideas that will actually make a difference if governments decide that it is worth their while, worth their next political campaign to actually jump on those horses. But let me come back to the issue of the right valuation as I mentioned it, and I suppose you were at the press conference this morning. You cannot, number one, borrow your consumption out of excessive debt forever. You have to put a stop to that. In the same way, you cannot bleed your reserves in order to support a currency that is overvalued. There's no magic to it. Currency has to be right valued. And the Jamaican dollar was overvalued. So it is to the credit of this government and the finance minister to have actually and the governor of the central bank, I should not forget him, to have taken that bull by the horns, because it's hard, because it impacts on consumers in the short term. In the medium and long term, if you manage to do that plus, because it's not in isolation that it happens, if you do that plus the structural reforms that will address excessive bureaucracy, that will make the environment more friendly, that will reduce the cost of energy, that will improve the tax collections. If you do all that, you improve the competitiveness of your economy. Foreign direct investors look at Jamaica with a different eye. Investors who refinance debt look at Jamaica with a different eyes. They don't look at Jamaica with some contempt in the back of their mind as if it was a country that cannot honor its commitment. So it's also an issue of dignity. Now, there has to be a stop. It cannot be forever, which is why I'm using the word right valuation. Because right valuation can imply 
devaluation, as is needed at the moment, because the currency was overvalued relative to others and, relative, and on the basis of the inflation rate that Jamaica had and has. But when inflation comes down, when the factors of production improve and when competitiveness is restored, that right valuation, as I said, does not imply devaluation. It will imply appreciation. I think the financial markets and the investors have to know that. Next person. Yes. Who, who, who has the other microphone? Go ahead, please. OK, thank you very much. My name is Liron Ling, president of the Guild of Students here at the Mona campus. And I must apologize, Dr. King, but I must um, welcome you on behalf of the students here at Mona, on behalf of the presidents at the Cayville campus and the St. Augustine campus, and on behalf of the Open Campus President, also welcome you, uh, Madam Lagarde, here to the Mona campus. And my question... Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and my question is with respect to the issue of tertiary education financing. Um, the Jamaican government some time ago, with arguable rationale, um, cut the subsidy to the University of the West Indies. Um, and it's a trend that seems to um, have continued. It, ha it has happened in Barbados, it has happened in Trinidad and Tobago. Up to yesterday, I got an email from my friends there in Trinidad about um, the potential of them, some law students losing their, their, their funding here at the, the University of the West Indies Mona campus. So the, it seems to be a trend um, that, that, that gov the government of the region is removing funding from tertiary education. And I'm just seeking your perspective um, on the issue of, of tertiary education financing. How wise um, or, or what impact do you think um, that policy or th that trend, if it continues, would be to the development of the region? Thank you. Madam, let me just add to that because that's actually very similar to a question that we got from Malcolm Bovella, who's a management student at Cave Hill in Barbados. In Barbados, they too have to engage in some fiscal consolidation. And as a result of that, they are introducing fees for the first time in their tertiary education. Mm -hmm. He also raised the question of the financing of tertiary education. So if you could address the question in that context. First of all, I think that investment in education in general, not only ter tertiary education, but education in general, is a massive priority in order to give young people an opportunity to have the skill set needed in order to join society, in order to be part of the fabrics of society, and in order to join the job market. So that's point number one. Point number two, I'd have to turn to um, Honorable Peter Phillips, because I don't know the details of the budget. But I would be extremely surprised if on, a, on an ongoing basis, there was not a priority assigned to the financing of education. You may want to comment on that. Third aspect, um, good education systems are probably the best ways, one of the best ways, to reduce inequality and to reduce the excessive inequality and the rising inequality that we see around the world. Because it's not just about tax redistribution. It's about all young people having a chance, having an opportunity to shine, to be educated, to learn, to become better at what they do or want to do. So, you know, absolute priority, way to reduce inequality by increasing the opportunities. And I would be surprised, as I said, that in this, you know, medium term cycle, the Jamaican authorities would want to uh, significantly cut down on spending in education. Now, you see, I'm saying significantly cut down. Uh, and I'm not just saying cut down, because I don't know what the budget is exactly saying on that front. 
um, he will be much better able to respond to that point. Now, the fourth point, and that's one um, which has an economic dimension as well, as to whether or not education should be identified as a service which has a value and therefore has a cost is another issue. And you know, I'm, I'm the president of the board of my former um, university, the advisory board. I'm not engaged, you know, as, as you are on a day-to-day -day basis. But this is a debate that we have had. And we concluded that rather than have students who take it for granted and assume that it's free, we would put in place a system that would be very progressive would depend on the resources available to students. So for those who do not have big resources, whose parents can, you know, cannot afford uh, much by way of, of, of funding, completely free by way of big scholarships. But above a certain threshold, a little bit of cost associated to the value of education and on a progressive basis so that those who actually have the means, and lots of it, contribute also to uh, the financing that I'm sure is so much needed in your university as it is in all universities. Um, but that's a personal view that I take. It's not an IMA view, also, although it's a very um, key economic issue. What, you know, what is the value of something which has no cost? Karen Delea is a social work student at the St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago. And thank you for your, um, your welcoming statement. I'm very attentive, very sensitive to that. She, she is concerned about depending on trickle-down economics. And so she would like you to talk a bit more about the growth agenda outside of you know, getting the balances right and the growth focus of the IMF outside of the usual um, focus on, on, on fiscal rectitude. So it's the contribution of women to growth? No, the contribution, the, the IMF's focus on promoting growth directly and meeting the social agenda and not just depending upon maintaining fiscal balances and hoping everything else falls in place. Right. Well, we have, you know, what we're doing is looking at all the contributors to growth and all the obstacles to growth. But as I said earlier on, and you will not blame me for that because I know that you are keen on fiscal sanity, it all begins with a stable environment from a macroeconomic point of view. But from there on, you have lots of areas where you can remove obstacles, you can remove bottlenecks, you can invest in infrastructure uh, for those who either have the fiscal space to do it or for those who can you know, put in place private sector um, partnership arrangements, that's one example of where we really activate, where we actively support uh, growth factors. Uh, the contribution of women is one that is definitely a point in case. You know, we have a, we have a question from Norma Hayward here at the University Center. And given, given what we appreciate about the contribution of women, especially in research that shows that gender diverse leadership actually leads to better run companies. Yeah. Um, she wants to know if having quotas is actually a good way to get to that goal. Yes. Gender quotas. Yes. Yes. Uh, undoubtedly. That's three yeses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'll tell you why it's three yeses from our point of view. It's a, a first yes for the gender. It's a second yes for the country of origin. And it's a third yes for the um, diversity of thinking and education. So those are, you know, those are my three yeses. I used not to be in favor of quotas. I used to belong to that category of young women who thought that we should just get there on our own merits and we didn't have, we didn't need to have quotas. Uh, and, and I'm sure that some of you feel that way. But then when you join some organizations where the women relative to men are abysmally small, and when you do your demographics and you realize that it's going to take 220 years to arrive at parity, you think to yourself, uh-uh, quotas are necessary for a given period of time. Once you've, you know, once you've, you've 
reached a good step, then you can do away because women can fight it on their own. Yeah. I really have to apologize to the audience because Madame Lagarde actually has another engagement that she has to run to. She has a very busy schedule today. So at this point, I do apologize, but I have to invite Mina Israel to come forward and give the vote of thanks for her visit okay. today. I really am sorry that we can't take any more questions. You can send me your question by email, by the way. They will be, huh? Will you? Okay. Oh, well. <laughs> Merci, huh? I didn't write it. Are you light? <laughs> Are you light? Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen who have all been recognized earlier, I'm very privileged to give the vote of thanks this afternoon. And as I said earlier, thank you sounds even better because above all, the University of the West Indies, our family here and across the region, is grateful for the honor and the opportunity to have you share with us, Madame Lagarde. We are indeed grateful. The University of West Indies has a global vision with a Caribbean focus, and therefore our mission really aligned well with your lecture today, your lecture on the challenge and the, the Caribbean and the IMF building a partnership for the future. We thank you for an enlightening and stimulating presentation, and as Dr. Roper said, done it so charmingly. We thank you for reminding us of the focus on ownership, stewardship, and partnership. And so, I must take an aside, and I see some of my women colleagues in the audience, in another hat that I wear as president of the International Women's Forum here in Jamaica, we want to say how much we have watched you, how much we are proud of you, how much we have seen your advocacy for women and youth. And we really want to tell you that we are following right back at you, as we would say in Jamaica. Thank you so much uh, to our minister, Phillips, our two men of the year, Governor and Richard, for EPOC and my dear friend Judith Green, to your team from the IMF, to our Vice Chancellor, Principal, and the leadership of UWE, but more so to our students here this afternoon. We want to tell you how much we appreciate you, how much we will send you those other questions that we didn't get to ask this afternoon. So I know we are pressed for time, and I won't even uh, pretend to be reading what I wrote but just to say how much we appreciate you, how much we thank you, and how much we want to see you soar even more. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much.